between Zach Thompson's up and down start, Nolan Arenado's misadventures in the clutch, and whatever happened with Brandon Crawford on that play defensively, we've got a lot to get to from the Cardinals' loss on Wednesday. Coming up on B Shave Daily. What's going on, everyone, and welcome in to this edition of B-Shafe Daily. Brendan Schaefer here in the evening hours of Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024. Cardinals with the home opener coming up on Thursday. We're all excited about that. Looking forward to that, right? Because I needed to give you something positive before I started talking about some negatives. Cardinals lose on Wednesday afternoon, the series finale in San Diego. Redbirds had an opportunity for a sweep as they won the first two games on Monday and Tuesday, got good pitching performances, got enough clutch hitting, and solid lockdown efforts by the bullpen. Well, that's not what we saw on Wednesday as the Cardinals, not a terrible performance that they get from Zach Thompson in this start, but I don't think it was the one that he wanted to have. And even though you go five innings and give up three runs, which is you know within the range to be able to keep the team competitive, I think the underlying elements of this outing for Thompson are more concerning than the final box score that just shows the three runs over five innings. Like, again, that keeps you competitive. You can live with that. It's the other stuff that I wonder if Zach Thompson is fixing to turn a corner or if we maybe need to temper some expectations. We'll talk about Zach Thompson and his outing in this episode of Be Shaved Daily, and we'll also get into kind of a lackluster day by the Cardinal offense as they left Seven runners on base going one for seven with runners in scoring position. Not a ton of opportunities scattered throughout this game against San Diego starter Joe Musgrove, who was decidedly on his game in this one. Seven strikeouts and just one run allowed in six innings. But the opportunities the Cardinals did have, I think there were enough of them, and particularly against the bullpen later on. Cardinals getting the benefit of some free passes, some hit-by-pitch opportunities, and they weren't able to cash in in the latter innings of this ball game to be able to make a run at the Padres. Cardinals lose it 3-2 to two with plenty to get to as we talk about maybe one of the primary frustrations from the game. Nolan Arenado's missed opportunity late in this one. Arenado did have an RBI in this game, had a base hit to lead off the scoring for the Redbirds as he drove in a run from second base back in the fourth inning. However, there was an opportunity for Arenado in the eighth inning that could have turned this game on its head and instead, Arenado grounds into a devastating 6-4-3 double play that, looking back on it, if you watch the replays, the San Diego broadcast predicted it as it was about to happen. The commentator saying, you know, how about a 6-4-3? I was getting texts from people leading up to the moment where people were saying, yeah, I think a 6-4-3 is probably incoming here. And, you know, sometimes Cardinals fans might have that that bit of a doomsday attitude about things, but it feels like, something bad's about to happen. But right now it does feel like things pertaining to Nolan Arenado are bad things about to happen. And it it maybe wasn't all too bold of a prediction to say that that one was going to go the wrong way because we just haven't seen Nolan look like Nolan all the way through. Now, I know that there are other guys in the lineup that have been struggling and that have been up and down as well. So it's not necessarily fair to paint the target on one man's back. But Arenado is your cleanup hitter and he's not doing as much cleaning up lately. That was an opportunity with the runners on first and second. Guys are getting hit by pitches. There's an opportunity to go out and tie this game and maybe go ahead in this game with your your cleanup hitter out there, and it didn't end up panning out for the Cardinals. So that was one moment that you look back on and you say, oh, no, but let's go ahead and track our way through this game a little bit because I do want to begin with Zach Thompson, and I promise I will get to it, but the defensive play by Brandon Crawford or better put, would be the lack of a play on a ball that we certainly thought he should have been able to get to that happened there in the second inning does kind of end up being the difference in this game. You can point to a lot of different areas of the game where uh, one run makes or breaks you because the Cardinals obviously lose this one three to two. Uh, But we'll get into the Brandon Crawford thing as well because that was a little bit disconcerting at at best and uh, a a downright disaster at worst. So we'll talk about that defensively from the, the veteran shortstop that played in lieu of Mason Wynn once again which was, you know, something that I think social media was scratching their heads about. Cardinals fans that I saw commenting on Twitter were a little bit perturbed by that, given that we're still in the first week of the season and you've got a 22-year-old shortstop that seemingly should be uh, fighting fit, as they uh, would say in the old Pokemon games after you head to the Pokemon Center. I know that's a completely random 
uh, analogy to draw a completely random reference, but it's just what was in my head. You go to the Pokemon Center and they'd say, your Pokemon are fighting fit. We hope to see you again. And I always think, well, I don't really want to see you again. I hope my Pokemon don't need to be healed. I hope that they're strong and ready for battle and they just can roll through this game, get the gym badges, beat the Elite Four and, you know, move on with life. Anyway, that was enough of a tangent um, into the, the world of pocket monsters, if you will. Okay. Let's go ahead and jump in, though. Zach Thompson, what do we think of his performance today, Cardinals fans? Let me know that in the comments below on YouTube here, and I think it is relevant because Sonny Gray is going to be returning before too long. I think he's probably going to get one more start when I'm referencing Zach Thompson before Sonny Gray is eligible to return and ready to return, and I don't think Zach Thompson necessarily did anything today to Im imminently lose his spot in the rotation until Gray comes back. Like I don't think they're necessarily going to replace him unless he's injured which is something that we may need to kind of question a little bit. I hate to play that game because I think throughout a baseball season, guys are always battling through some things. But at a certain point, you kind of take a look at what you see on the data and go, is something deeper going on here? I certainly hope not. But it is getting a little bit head-scratching with what we're seeing from Zach Thompson from a velocity standpoint. And I'll talk about some of the numbers and, and what I thought of them and – what I thought generally of Zach Thompson's performance, but let me know in the YouTube comment section below. And by the way, quick plug to hit the subscribe button in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. If you enjoy Cardinals content throughout the season or here on YouTube, youtube.com slash at bshafer12. You can also follow or subscribe to bshafe daily on Spotify, Apple podcasts, just search bshafe daily. Give us a five-star review as well, because I like to collect those. Got to catch them all kind of like the Pokemon thing. Okay. I won't say Pokemon again, I don't, I don't know if a lot of my audience cares about that, so I really got to lay off. Okay, Zach Thompson, here's what I thought. Too much command issues in the early portion of this outing. He walks in a run in the first inning. It was six, seven consecutive balls, something like that. He was getting squeezed a little bit, but he was very erratic as well. And I don't generally have a problem when a guy is that all over the place surrounding the strike zone and not finding a way to pound the zone. I... I give the umpire the benefit of the doubt that if there's a ball that technically might have been on the dot, might have been on the, you know, covering up a, a spot that would have been a strike, it's on the plate, should have called it, but it wasn't necessarily the target of the pitcher, which I think you could say would have been the case on that ball four that walked in the run in the first inning. I, I don't really the, tend to blame the umpires in those spots. You have to have better command of what you're trying to do. Like, don't put the umpire in a position to be fooled. I know a strike is a strike, and it shouldn't be a big deal, and now everybody's going to claim her for the automatic stri ball strike system when something like that happens. Um, but, but look, I don't know that that ball four was necessarily all too controversial for me because I just thought Zach Thompson was all over the place when that was going on. And to me, I don't mind my umpires having that context. Um, I, I, I think it is a little bit backwards at times, and there will be a lot of baseball fans who don't agree with me on that take. But I look at it and go, man, my frustration was not with the umpire for not giving, you know, throwing Zach a bone in that spot. It was the previous three balls and then and then even that one that could have been called a strike. Just not really, it just didn't seem like he was really in command of what he was trying to do. And it was a little bit difficult to watch. Now, to his credit, he came back, got the strikeout to end the first inning, and that did limit the damage there, but still dealing with a little bit of that as well in the second inning and beyond. At the end of the day, Zach Thompson gets through five, but four bases on balls, four walks, Five strikeouts, which is still an, a sign that the stuff is there. There is good stuff to be played with. Um, five hits allowed. For me, though, it's the walks that, that really do become a source of frustration. And then the home run that he gave up to Higashioka as well out there in the fourth inning. I'll talk about sort of my thought on that because Zach Thompson, in the beginning, you're dealing with a little bit of, of a muted velocity because he's throwing like 91, 92 maybe in the first inning which is not typically where Zach Thompson's been when he's been right. It has been a bit of a trend going back to spring training for Zach Thompson to be dealing with lower velocity. After his last start, he talked about still having some, you know, some some bit of a process, we'll call it, syncing up with his mechanics to get the most out of his arm and, and, and his velocity. That, you know, buzzword, you know, syncing up mechanics. I don't know mechanically what's wrong. I don't know as much about pitching as Zach Thompson does or as the Cardinals pitching staff, uh, coaching staff does, but... If he says he's trying to sync up some mechanics and, and it hasn't evidently happened yet, then I would say some things mechanically are, are going wrong in his mind. At least that would have been the explanation, you know, after the last game. Today, the comments that I read from Zach Thompson, and again, I'm not in San Diego for the series. I will be covering 
All the action tomorrow on Thursday afternoon at Bush Stadium when the Cardinals take on the Marlins for the home opener. I'll be down at Bush this weekend. But as far as what's going on in San Diego, I just read what I can. It seemed like Zach said, look, it's a, a case of kind of battling with the stuff that you have. He grits through the outing without maybe having his best stuff. But velocity-wise, that was evident to me with the low 90, you know, 90, 91 is what it really was was uh, sitting around. And then it started to sort of decline from there. But in the early inning, you're going, all right, it's a problematic situation to have the command be all over the place. You're also dealing with the the velocity issue here. And then you go to the middle, middle, just put it right on a tee at 90 miles per hour in the fourth inning pitch to Higashioka. Kyle Higashioka with the home run. That was the third run for San Diego, and it's all they would get on the day, which is sort of the upside there because they were done scoring after the fourth. Credit to uh, not only Zach Thompson for getting through a clean fifth, but the bullpen as well for throwing up three zeros. We finally got a look at Ryan Fernandez, who struck out the side, did give up a walk, did give up a hit, but uh, had three strikeouts in his eighth inning of work. So maybe that is a guy that you want to give some opportunities to. It is interesting that Fernandez finally does get his look when the Cardinals are down by just one run and really could use somebody keeping it right there and, and then coming out and trying to, to make a go of this thing in the ninth. But it was just far past time for Fernandez to get into a game. Again, I, I think it should have been the second day of the season that he got a chance to pitch. It happens today, and he doesn't give up any runs. Cardinals uh, were able to hold it there because of him, although they don't score in the ninth inning anyway. So what big difference did it make? But that's at least something to hang your head on a little bit as it pertains to uh, the, the one guy in the bullpen that we really hadn't seen anything of. Uh, the Rule 5 pick from Boston. At least he's showing some good stuff, and we'll see what more we see of him and in terms of what type of role he could uh, occupy for this Cardinal team as things go along there. But you're dealing with the command issues. You're dealing with the velocity thing. And then you start throwing strikes, but you're not commanding within the zone. So that's kind of another layer to the command conversation to me. First things first, you got to be able to throw strikes so that you're not walking in free runs like happened in the first. And then, but once you're in the zone, there does become another layer to it where it's like you don't want to throw middle, middle on a tee, 90 miles per hour, just, uh, you know, just a pretty hittable pitch in a pretty perfect location if you're a hitter, and it's gone. Velocity then declined even further, though, as the outing goes. I was checking out the stat cast. He was like 87, 88 by the fifth inning of this game, and I just don't know how that sits with me. Like, I understand mechanically you're doing some of this. You're trying to work. He didn't drop, to my knowledge, uh, you don't understand the art of pitching on anybody today the way that uh, Jack Flaherty did last year when – People were kind of saying, hey, we noticed you're throwing, you know, 90 instead of 95 like we're used to seeing from you. What's going on with that? And Zach, you know, Zach really, I don't think, has got that sort of that sort of edge to him where he's going to get defensive to the extent that Jack did last year at times. Um, and Jack has dealt with an injury history to where any time you're going to, going to poke the bear on that, it can be understandable that a guy is going to kind of uh, go into his hard shell and say, you know, Kind of, kind of fire back a little bit, right? And that's that's what I think we saw with Jack last year when all of that went down. Uh, I, I think Zach Thompson is a fiery, competitive guy, but I don't think that that's necessarily uh, an apples to apples comparison to say that if you're kind of poking and asking about the stuff and the velo, um, that he's necessarily going to going to have that same sort of reaction. However, like Zach Thompson, unless I'm crazy, Zach Thompson's thrown 100 miles per hour before. Like this was a guy that could that has at times in the past hit triple digits. Unless I'm just misremembering. I know this guy has the ability to sit more like 95, 96 and touch upper 90s at times. And he's alluded to, as I mentioned, kind of battling through, gritting through some of the outings with what he's got. And to his credit, he's stayed competitive. I mean, gave up the three home runs against the Dodgers, and that meant five earned runs because one of them was a three-run shot. But today, five innings, three runs, that's not going to be a Sterling ERA. I don't know off the top of my head what that uh, conversion is. I know six innings, three runs would be a four and a half ERA. So you're probably talking about five and change on the ERA if you did that every single time out. But with an offense that should be top five, top 10, at a minimum, the Cardinals should be able to get you lots of wins if you go five and three every single time. Nobody's going to be consistent and do the same thing each time. But that would be the type of outing that I think uh, as a blueprint you would take from ostensibly your number five starter. I know that Zach Thompson was kind of lined up second in the rotation, but that was due to a variety of, of factors. He's You figure he's kind of your, your fifth starter because Sonny Gray was out and he was the guy that stepped in. He wouldn't have been in the rotation if Sonny Gray was here. So yeah, he's your fifth starter in, in so much as the way I look at it. 
And if he's going five and three, you can take that. But the velocity thing to me is at least officially a yellow flag. I, I'm I'm not saying it's a red flag and that we need to, you know, that we're necessarily going to see him on the IL tomorrow. But it is a little bit strange for the number of, of outings you go in a row. And again, I don't know anything about pitching. <laughs> I don't, not compared to these guys. I understand that you maybe do toggle your velocity at times, but also I think if you've got 95 in your arm, and we've seen that a number of times in the past, that it would just be preferable to, to see it here. So if he could do that right now, I think he would be doing that. Um, it just feels like a drastic drop to know that a guy is has been traditionally in that kind of mid-90s range, whether it's 94, 95, whatever. At times, you know, you get up there in the upper 90s. I think it's a big difference to see him go to 90, 91, and then on down to like 87, 88 for the final inning. That is an element of maybe the difference between starting and relieving. Like, that's not an element of this that's lost on me entirely. But I just think, again, like, there is there there is a little bit of something here that, that feels a little bit odd. That you're, okay, you're two starts now into the regular season. It's not spring training. He's working through things, clearly. But is it something that you can go, yeah, I've got confidence that he's going to quickly turn this around if he's not able to sync up whatever's going on mechanically and find that next level of velocity? Because Zach Thompson is... It, feels at times like he's close because when you look at the game, I, I was able to name a bunch of things I didn't like about his outing. Didn't like the lack of command and walking four guys. I didn't like the the low velocity when I have uh, historically seen him be able to bring more. It doesn't really matter if he's, if he's getting guys out with it, then I would probably just say, all right, whatever. But the fact that he's also kind of searching and, and reaching for velocity and command at the same time, and he's not really been able to find either. And then you talk about sort of, uh, making pitches that are mistake pitches and with the velocity, they're going to be easier to punish because it's at 90 instead of 96, which maybe by that point, was, fourth inning was the Higashioka home run. I don't think 96 is necessarily an expectation for Thompson as of the fourth inning in a start, but you know, 93, 94, perhaps 90 middle middle though, is you're combining the, the element of man, he's been searching for command and so now you try to be a little too fine with it, perhaps, and it's just, it's on a tee for a guy. Like, I can sort through and talk through, as I just have, some of the elements that I didn't like from his start. What do I like is that, at the end of the day, five innings, three runs, is really all he needs to be doing. If he's your fifth starter, it's kind of incumbent upon the offense at that point to do its job. It's just a frustration, though, because if you can go five and three, looking like Zach Thompson looked for a decent portion of this outing, and I would say it's kind of similar, you know, bears resemblance to what happened against the Dodgers where he was doing some good things and was was punished by a few mistakes that he made. It's kind of another example of this today where you go, man, he didn't really pitch that well. I, I was not fond of a number of the things that happened, but he had some innings where he was able to just kind of cruise through it. And at the end of the, the outing, your five innings, three runs, like that's competitive. So if he can be competitive looking, you know, just... I wouldn't even say this was like his C game. I think he's got much better stuff than, and, and just the ability to command that he showed today for whatever reason that it happened. And so it is a little bit, you know, puzzling when you go, man, five and three, that's, you take that from your number five. There are times last year where the Cardinals would be, I mean, they'd have performed a ritual sacrifice of Fred Bird at times to get five and three from that starting rotation in 2023. So it's like, don't look the gift horse in the mouth. But on the other side of that, I think there's more for Zach Thompson but I don't know if he's going to be able to to grasp at more until the velocity thing straightens itself out. So that's sort of my all-encompassing thoughts on, on the situation as it pertains to Zach Thompson. Let me know again in the comments what you guys thought of all of that. Let's also mention, before we get into our, our view of the offense today, the way that the Padres were able to score a run off Zach in the second inning was really not entirely his fault. I know that this ball that was hit at 69 miles per hour was shaded a little bit up the middle for Brandon Crawford at shortstop. But we got to talk about this play because I don't know what that was. I don't, I don't understand. Um, again, like by the time they turned the camera, I expected, because you could tell off the bat when you're watching this on TV, you could tell off the bat that this is, all right, it's a little bit up the middle. And I don't really know exactly what the shifting situation is, how deep in the hole the shortstop is. But with the ball hit at that velocity, I didn't know it was, you know, 68, 69 off the bat, whatever it ended up being. I think that was John Denton. Uh, somebody had put that up on Twitter. Uh, yeah, 69.2 off the bat. Off the bat of uh, Xander Bogarts. 
And I figure you flip the camera and Brandon Crawford's going to be there. You know, he's going to be there ready to make a play on this ball. And if he can't work quickly enough to get the double play out of it, okay. But that feels like almost just sure a flip to second. Gorman throws to first. We know he's got a good arm. And even with a guy like Bogarts who can run a little bit, you're it's going to be a double play ball most of the time. And he doesn't even get to the ball. It goes into center field and later on leads to a run scoring as a result because of the, the base runner able to go from first to third. I don't know what that was. I'm watching this play over and over, and I still don't really know what happened there with Brandon Cross. It's just moving slow. It's just like a, a negative range factor. I'm going to watch it again. Let me just, in real time here, the camera flips, and it's just like he is moving in molasses. And that, I, you know, it's one play. But we don't have a large sample size of Brandon Crawford as a Cardinal at this point. We do have a decent sample size of what he did last year. And defensively last year at shortstop, which is the only position he's ever played, the Cardinals signed him and they said, no, we don't really need him to move around. We just are going to have him be the backup shortstop. It's Mason's job, though. He's going to, you know, Crawford's just going to kind of fill in here and there. We've seen him start twice in this week, though. And the the word from Ollie Marmel, you may not agree with it. You may not understand it, but they basically see that Mason's the guy that they have. And so they want to keep him fresh and they want to try to avoid throughout the season, having him wear down as you get into the dog days. And so that is a process that apparently begins right now to make sure that you, you know, you you've got every bit of his battery juiced up when he does go out there to play. And part of that is Brandon Crawford in this part. I really understand even less, uh, I believe was the, the, the quote from Ollie Marmel. And I'm reading it here off of Jeff Jones's timeline, covers the Cardinals for the Belleville News Democrat. Regarding Wynn getting a second day off, Marmel said that one of the challenges of a full season in the big leagues compared to his workload in the minors is dealing with the daily mental grind at this level, which is kind of pertaining to what I had said there, the, the, the win angle of this. But here's the Crawford angle as well as I, I read the next tweet from Jeff. The Cardinals are choosing the path that guarantees he doesn't reach a point of his batteries getting too low with a somewhat conservative early season schedule. So they're doing this on purpose. Here's the part about Crawford. It also fits to make sure Crawford stays in rhythm while getting used to the bench. You know, I just don't know if he needs that part, uh, that rhythm part, because really he's going to play sparingly. And the, the the less he plays, the better, because it means Mason Wynn is, is doing his thing. And certainly Mason Wynn turns that ball today into a double play. I, don't, I just don't think there's any doubt. He probably turns it into a 6-3 double play. He may not even need to flip it to Nolan Gorman to have him do the rest. And this was a ball that that Brandon Crawford laid out for and did not even get a, a get leather on this ball. So, I mean, he was brought in to be the backup shortstop and to spell Mason win, and that's what he's doing. What's the quality of that performance though going to be? You know, the, the narrative a little bit was, well, last year the defensive metrics didn't like him, but he was also playing hurt playing through quite a few injuries. And so that's not really what they believe, you know, Brandon Crawford to be defensively uh, or offensively for that matter. His offensive numbers weren't that good. Well, we're seeing him in the year of 2024 defensively. And I know it's an early, you know, it's, it's early. It's just the first couple of looks we're getting at him, but that's a play where you go, man, that can change a game. The Cardinals have had some really nice moments defensively. They've been a pretty crisp team through the first week defensively. That's not an example of it. And they lost this game three to two in that run that, ended up at third base that should have been forced out at second, ended up scoring. He was the guy that scored in that that second inning. So the game plan was Brandon Crawford, you know, to to be the backup. And I understood it at the time, but he's got to be able to to fulfill that role with, a with, you know, at a level of competency. And we'll see what that looks like. I'm not saying, like, abandon the experiment. You know, it's not going to work. Just give him his $2 million and tell him to go home. That's not what I'm saying. Um, he's a veteran. I get that. My eyes though are telling me a story here and and it kind of goes back to what I was thinking in spring when they signed Crawford, they said, okay, at least they're doing the thing they said they would do for Edmund and they're going to make him an outfielder full time. And of course now Edmund still is not healthy. And and so that's kind of a red herring of the whole thing anyway, but that was their goal was sign Crawford and have Edmund be your full time outfielder and center. And you don't need to worry about the backup shortstop spot, but you could have done it perhaps another way internally if this is the level of play that we're, we're perhaps going to be uh, experiencing. Like, Jose Fermin had a good spring training offensively. I view him as a light-hitting infielder that, that you know, maybe doesn't have the best arm at short, but I think he probably at least gets one on that play. 
and he's not on this roster, which is fine. But you you know you paid sort of a name brand guy to come and do this job, but it doesn't matter. I think that he does it well or it, or competently. So we'll see. That just wasn't a good moment for Brandon Crawford. I don't want to. I know I'm going to end up talking about this for six or seven minutes. I think that's probably overkill. But again, we're talking about every single game. That's what we do on B Shape Daily. That's what we do on this YouTube channel. And I just look at that as a play that happened early in the game, but it ended up kind of looming large against the Cardinals in the way that the game played out because they lose it three to two. And that in many cases can be an ending ending double play. And if you just watch the way that, that Crawford tried to track toward that ground ball, you're like, man, I mean, Fermin could do that. Jose Fermin could do that. Thomas said JC could do that, right? Like I know he played a little bit of short. I was high on the list of people that said, Hey, this guy could fit on your bench. If you really wanted to make it work in spring, if he's hitting well, which he did, and if he could play a little shortstop, you know, that works out. Brendan Donovan could do that. You know, I, I know that they maybe don't want to put Brendan Donovan at short, and he's doing his thing in, in left field anyway, which, by the way, he had to leave the game. He was hit twice uh, by pitches today, and Siani ended up coming in for him in left field toward the end. I don't know what the implication on that injury is, but um, nevertheless. And I also understand with Sejaci on that on that uh, topic of conversation, playing time for a guy that you do consider like a prospect that needs to be built up and he needs to play every day so that when he gets to the big leagues, he can play and be a star. That's a, that's hopefully what can happen for Thomas to JC. And so maybe that's why he's not a good option for your bench. But if the guy's going to, you know, that backup shortstop is going to play a couple times a week, that's at least something. And you can maybe find room for the JC to get into the lineup elsewhere. He might be able to start at third a day for Arenado um, at this point with the way things are going there. Uh, but anyway, you know, I, I just think it's a little bit interesting that I, I think the Cardinals almost take that, whatever just feels like the most obvious route where they say, oh, we have a need. It's a shortstop need. So who's a veteran shortstop that's out there that's done this before? And was there what was the level of consideration to, okay, is this an improvement over what we have internally? Like, clearly we're not thrilled with what we have internally. Um, otherwise, you'd let Jose Fermin be the backup shortstop and the utility sort of infielder, light-hitting infielder that can play a couple of infield positions, play third, play short, play second, and you would have just let that happen, and you would have saved two million bucks. But clearly, they thought, no, this is the, the route we need to go is to bring in Brandon Crawford, and so they did that. And they said it wasn't for a veteran, you know, presence sort of reason because they had Matt Carpenter for that. They felt like the the cupboard was was stocked on that front, which I think Cardinals fans would agree. They just needed the shortstop, the guy that was ex- experienced at the position. But is he better than Jose Fermin at this point defensively? Um, you know, I don't know. I think it's interesting. Uh, offensively, uh, to Brandon Crawford's credit, he reached base via walk a couple of times today. Did strike out the two at-bats uh, that weren't walks, but that's kind of where we're at. You know, I'm interested to see what it looks like for Crawford. I have been beating the drum on, hey, don't judge guys based off of a small sample size here in the first week. And we'll talk about, you know, Arenado struggling. It's something that we're all noticing, but again, it's still the first week. That's always going to be the context that I throw in there. Well, I should even be, you know, more inclined to say that with Brandon Crawford, who's only played a couple of games as compared to playing the bulk of the opportunities so far. So we've spent enough time talking about this, but I was curious, Cardinal fans, what you thought of the Brandon Crawford play in the second inning there, because it did, I mean, uh, just in reality, end up being a costly one uh, for a team that lost this game 3-2 to two today. But now that we've got that out of the way, let's go ahead and dive into the offense and what we saw from the Cardinals in this game. I mentioned one for seven with runners in scoring position, left seven men on base. Uh, two hits for Ivan Herrera was a little bit of an interesting lineup. Again, we touched on Crawford playing over win Herrera catching and Contreras DHing. I actually like quite a bit because it seemed like the Cardinals were reluctant last year when they had Kisner hitting well to use him and Contreras in the same lineup, unless they had trace Barrera sitting around doing nothing. You don't need a third catcher. You just don't. If there's an injury, something happens and Herrera gets hurt. Contreras can begin to catch the rest of that game and yeah, sure, you lose the DH and the pitcher will have to bat and that'll be like kind of a, a stink bug for a day. And then if you need an IL stint, you call up another catcher and it is it is what it is. And that catcher probably will be more of a reserve backup catcher. Uh, Pedro Pajas would probably be the next guy in line for that. And not to say he can't be a good big league player, but I don't know that he has uh, the, the bat right now that they believe Yvonne Herrera has and they want to get his bat in the lineup when they possibly can, particularly when they're going against left-handed pitching. I think you'll see that a good bit of time, but they did it today against uh, Joe Musgrove as well. And, you know, Musgrove had a good day, but ultimately so too did Yvonne Herrera, who was the only Cardinal to have multiple hits in this game. 
Everybody else that got a base hit just capped themselves out at one. Ivan Herrera goes two for four. Uh, Crawford was on base twice with the walks, as I mentioned, um, but he had two strikeouts. Up and down the lineup, guys were striking out. It's nothing new. 11 Ks for the Cardinals. I believe they are third, third most in baseball in strikeouts. The Dodgers, interestingly enough, are first, but they've also played an additional game. That was at least as of me checking things out earlier today. Uh, night games have gone on, and those numbers have maybe changed. But as of the Cardinals wrapping up their game, I checked it out, and I thought, oh, okay, the Cardinals are third in baseball with the most strikeouts, and that kind of feels about right. And we alluded to Nolan Arenado struggling, and he did have the RBI, so we want to give him credit for that. But that's a tough, tough spot in the eighth inning when you come to the the six four three. It kind of kills the vibe of the team. It felt like it ended the game. Even though you're within one run and you're threatening in the ninth inning, which they ultimately were able to do, falling short with Victor Scott striking out there at the end. We'll talk about Victor a little bit here in a moment. But it just felt like the wind kind of leaves the sails in a spot like that. It's your cleanup, man. And I get it. You know, double plays are going to happen from time to time. What did Albert Pujols, like, lead history in double play balls? He's the greatest hitter I've ever seen. That's going to happen. But it just wasn't a good feeling seeing it in that moment for a guy who has struggled so much early. It is early in the season. You're talking about, you know, seven games at this point. But he's your cleanup guy and didn't clean up in that spot. You just needed him to put the ball, you know, put in the air somewhere. Maybe it drops. Maybe you scored a tying run. Give you something to kind of get juiced about. And it just didn't go that way. I see people talking about moving him in the lineup. I don't know if you do that just yet, but I'm also not inherently opposed to it, especially if Wilson continues to hit well and, and you like the idea of Contreras batting third for a little while. And he was one for two today, also reached base with a walk, uh, reached base. The guy just keeps getting hit by pitches, man. That's the other thing. He's got to be about plum tired of getting hit in the hand, in particular by pitches the way that he has had happen a number of times. Donovan was hit twice today. Contreras was hit on the hand. It looked like the glove hand to me, that front hand when he's batting. So it's the catcher that would be sort of the backside of that hand, which cannot be comfortable when you're trying to catch 90, 95 from your pitching staff. And then uh, Victor Scott as well was hit by a pitch later on in the game. Four hit by pitches. Cardinals also reach base via walk four times, have six hits, and they're only able to muster three runs or pardon me, two runs. They'd muster three runs. We'd have been talking about a tie game and, Maybe they'd still be playing, but a little bit of a disappointing day offensively. Yeah, I mean, more than a little bit. I don't have to sugarcoat that. It was a, it was a, a bummer of a day offensively because you did have opportunities that the Padres were trying to give you those opportunities, the free passes and the hit-by-pitches. That's eight base runners that the Cardinals were not able to capitalize with, and a number of times it ends in double plays. That's how you only go uh, and leave seven on base. Arenado, Goldsmith, and Walker had a double play ball as well. Walker looks rough. Uh, That's another guy that we can, you know, again, it's been a week, but he's 0 for 3. Two strikeouts was taken out, actually, for Alec Burleson in a tight spot late in the game because they were were seeing the the at-bats that he was taking and it wasn't looking great. But Burley's numbers are, are, you know, are down as well. He struck out in the opportunity that he had. So, um, yeah, it's just a lot of guys struggling. I am going to say we're not pressing the panic button on anything just yet because it may be necessary to do so on some, and I'm, I, that includes Crawford, that includes Arnado, that includes Walker. Like, let's just let this play out for a little bit. It includes Nolan Gorman, who, again, uh, you know, had an over three day, walked, did strike out again, be sitting 192. The Cardinals have, I, I can count them, within their starting lineup, Arnado, Gorman, Walker, Victor Scott, all with an OPS below 500. Burleson is as well at 389, but he's not really an everyday guy necessarily. Herrera, Crawford, if we're going to talk about guys that are below 550. I mean, Mason wins at 607. You've got a lot of low OPSs, a lot of 167s, a lot of 190s going on in this in this lineup for the Cardinals at times. Gorman's hitting 192. So it, whether it's your bench guys, your starters, it's just been a lineup that hasn't really capitalized yet. Victor Scott's hitting 120. I'll talk about why I really don't care about that here in a moment. But my takeaway, and I've seen some people say, you know, Jordan Walker, I think they need to send him down. When it comes time for Newt Bar to return, don't send down Victor Scott. Don't send down Siani. Send down Jordan Walker and let him get some ABs and AAA. I am absolutely not at that point. Look, if he's still hitting 190 with a 465 OPS at the end of April and he's been playing every day, we can have a conversation at that point. I think they sort of did him dirty last year by pumping his tires and saying, this guy is major league ready. We saw him. He... He knows how to deal with failure, and he, I mean, they were singing his praises coming out of spring, and then a few weeks later, they go, oh, man, we really can't afford to put him defensively in the outfield every day, especially when we've got these five other options that are all competing for spots, 
and the manager just for a few days out in San Francisco in a spacious outfield didn't put him in the outfield. And what do you know? Like a day later, they sent him down. And I'm like, what? You guys didn't think this was going to happen? Was there no foresight whatsoever to the situation? Are we just making decisions, you know, flying by the seat of our pants? What's going on here with 20-year-old Jordan Walker? So I, w- I had issues with the way they did that last year. And I get it. They wanted him to launch the ball more. And that's a noble goal. Like, if he'd be launching the ball more right now, he'd probably have some more success, right? It's seven games, though, for a 21-year-old player. My take is, if you believe in this guy to be your every day, to be, you know, a franchise cornerstone in the future, and I say every day without listing a position, because maybe the answer isn't right field. If defensively he can't, you know, play out at that position and have it have it be a league average look for the next several years, then we can have a conversation about, you know, moving him or DH or whatever needs to happen down the road. But if he's an everyday franchise cornerstone in your lineup, I'm not going to look at seven games and go, well, time to do it again. Send him down. I think that's silly. I think it's silly when you look up. You're going to send Arenado down too? You know, Noel Gorman's hitting 190. You better send him down. Like, let's just take a break. Let's just take a quick breath. Um, to me, it's it's clear you send Siani down, even though he has been uh, a value defensively when he comes in as a late game replacement. But you're going to have Lars Newpar, and so that role is going to be just probably less valuable because Newpar is going to be playing those full games defensively. Now, if something is to come of the the Donovan situation where he leaves the game with a hit by pitch, I, I haven't seen necessarily post game. So if there's something out on on exactly the the circumstances of that and if he's going to be out for a number of games or if he's going to be, you know, doomsday scenario is that this is an injury that puts you on the injured list. But it did look like he was kind of clocked on the elbow area, which can be kind of tender. That can be a a spot that, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. If there's some swelling on that, maybe they, yeah, I mean, that that's kind of right, clocked him right on the elbow now that I watched the replay. So, I don't know. I didn't see anything as far as uh, to come from that, but I bet that's going to balloon up overnight, if nothing else. We'll see if he's in the lineup for opening day for the for the home opener tomorrow. I don't know. But maybe that kind of changes your your thought process and the decision on, on what you do with that spot. But for me, it's not Victor Scott going down. That's really what I want to get to. It's not Jordan Walker either. Like, let's just take a break. Let's, let's give these guys a, a few weeks at least before we start changing everything that we believe about these players. I understand it hasn't looked great from Jordan Walker. I can I can list five other Cardinals where the same thing is true. It hasn't looked great from those guys either. So I'm going to try to be equal opportunity where I say, look, I'm not going to say, well, this guy's clearly overmatched. Send him down if I wouldn't say it about some of the others that are performing at the same level. And that's what brings me to Victor Scott. It'll be the final topic that we'll talk about today because I don't really have much to say about the bullpen. I mentioned Ryan Fernandez. Uh, that's good that he was able to have the three strikeouts. Polante had a scoreless inning. Libertor has scoreless sitting. Good for both of those guys because they've had a little bit of uh, inflated ERAs to begin the season. But I don't have much else to say about the bullpen. Uh, they, they did well today. They did their job, and unfortunately, the offense didn't. That's why the Cardinals lose this game, combined with the fact that it could have been sort of, you know, a two-to-two to, two to two game, two-to-one game if Zach Thompson gets a little bit of help from Brandon Crawford in the second and then maybe doesn't serve one up to Gashioka. You could be talking about riding the rail with a bullpen and winning this game two-to-one. Two runs is not enough to expect to be able to win a game, but they were not too far off from having that level of pitching today. Now, granted, I understand that if this game was tied or they had the lead late, you probably wouldn't be going to the same, you know, parade out of the bullpen going to guys like Palante, or it was Libertor first and then Palante and Fernandez. You'd probably be trying to 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 use your A squad and and try and go out and win the game if you if you had the lead to hold it. But nevertheless, like they weren't that far off. The offense has to be better, but there were also some pitching things and the defensive thing by Crawford where you look at it and go, yeah, this was one that kind of got away. You still win the series. They do say sweeps are hard for a reason, but that's kind of my thought. I want to touch on Victor Scott, though. Him scoring easily on the, the thrown away double play attempt in the eighth inning. That was how the Cardinals got their second run. I That's just what he does, man. I know he's not an elite hitter. He should probably be your number nine hitter and and stay there, and I realized that he, he struck out to end the game on 99 up from Robert Suarez. He did foul off several at 99 and 100 in that at bat. Um, you know, he's a he's a hitter. I think he's just going to continue to battle, and other guys are battling and, and losing some of those battles. But Victor Scott loses some, too. That doesn't mean that I am worried or that he's overmatched, in my opinion. I'm going to have to kind of keep going to that because I, I had been pretty loud early in spring training. Like, this guy should make the team. If the Cardinals are serious, he should make the team. So... This is me, you know, if you're seeing something different from Victor Scott and you think the 120 batting average is indicative, which maybe, you know, maybe it is. Maybe he's a 200 hitter. 
Maybe he's a 175 hitter at this point. I don't know. I think he's probably more like a 220, 230 hitter when it all levels out. Um, not going to be a ton of power there, and and he will draw some walks and get hit by pitches like he did today. So for an on-base percentage, if it's you know 320, 310, 320, I, I, I think that's probably something within the range of outcomes. That might be a little bit lofty for uh, what we could see from him at this point in time. But if it's a 310 on base and a 350 slug for a 660 OPS, you'd say, well, that's not very good. I think that's enough because this guy is like an automatic run when he gets on bases. Things just tend to happen around him, and I think that matters. He's like a free square. When he gets on base, he's like a free square, and more often than not, you're going to see him advance around the bases. The pitchers are going to lose their freaking minds. The the fielders are going to do stuff they wouldn't normally do because he's just kind of like in the back of their mind running around doing Victor Scott stuff. And that's a thing. Like, the Cardinals don't have other guys like that. Mason Wynn's a good base runner. He's got really good wheels. Tommy Evan, when he's healthy, good base runner, good wheels. Victor Scott is a completely different level. He has an impact on the psyche of the opponent. I think that's absolutely a tangible thing. He's hitting 120. Maybe that's a good thing because everybody else is hitting 160, 190. And we're going, well, you can't really focus on one guy, any one player, and say, well, he's been terrible because half the lineup is doing the same thing. So, hey, Victor Scott's just fitting in. But look. I think that there is more in the tank than what you're seeing from his batting line right now. And he's, I mean, on a game-to-game basis, even with the the way that it's played out, he he when he gets on base, he scores, right? He's got five runs. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how that ranks among the other, uh, among all the Cardinal players. I guess I can look that up real quick. Who's leading the team in runs scored at this point? He's got to be up there. Yeah, Brendan Donovan's got six. He's your leadoff guy. So he's got a few extra plate appearances, you figure, than, than Scott does. Victor Scott scored five times. Like, I don't know what to tell you. The, the game is about scoring more runs than your opponent, and he's going to find ways to do it, even if he's got a 414 OPS like he does right now. He's in 120, but he's got a 214 on base because he, he has drawn um, a couple of walks. He's been hit by some pitches. I'm telling you what, man, I am, I'm not touching Victor Scott. I do think he should be batting ninth. Like, they're putting him seventh and eighth and stuff at times. Bat him ninth. Have him be just a direct correlation uh, to Brendan Donovan. I get it. They're both lefties. I don't care. We don't have to do the lefty-righty thing when it comes to our the, the 9-1 crossover. Like, that's I'm good. I'm good with it. You go ahead. Let them bring in a lefty against Victor Scott if they really want to. Um, if, if anything, just make that lefty field a bunt on the first base, or on the third base side, rather, and make him spin and throw you out at first base. And then Donovan, who doesn't care if you're a lefty or a righty, can bat at leadoff, and, and hopefully he's healthy, knock on wood, and the elbow thing isn't too much of a concern. But yeah, he's he scored five runs. It's more than every Cardinal not named Brendan Donovan. Uh, scoring runs is good, and so I, I rest my case on Victor Scott for the time being. I still think he's taking uh, good enough at-bats that it's, I'm just not concerned in the, in the least bit about what we're seeing from uh, from Victor Scott despite the the low batting average. Let me know what you think, Cardinals fans. you agree or disagree on the Victor Scott takes? you agree or disagree on kind of wondering what the heck happened there with Brandon Crawford? How do we feel about Zach Thompson? And boy, what's the concern level for the lineup, and in particular, Nolan Arenado after a rough game today? Let me know in the comment section below what you think. Make sure to follow Be Shape Daily on Spotify. Click that subscribe button in the lower right corner of this YouTube video so you're subscribed to my channel for all my content the rest of the way, including this weekend. The home opener at Bush Stadium is tomorrow. Cannot wait. We'll have content behind it. We'll be writing things for KMOV.com, so make sure to check that out. And leave a like on this video. Maybe we can hit 100 likes on this one. That's going to do it for this edition of the show. Thank you guys so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time on Be Shape Daily. Peace.